So on the 19th of October, I passed 50,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, which I still kind of can't believe that that many of you want to listen to me just chat away about space, but you do, so hooray. Um, by now, I think I'm already on something like 52,000 subscribers. So as a celebration, I decided to do an Ask Me Anything, where I put up a poll on my Instagram stories that all of you could ask me a question and I would try and respond to all of them. I've not responded to all of them here because this would be an hour long video and I'm sure you guys would love that, but editing Becky, mm -mm, she does not like to edit. <laughs> so if I haven't answered your question here, it will be on my Instagram stories instead for you to answer there. First of all, you can see I'm clearly not in my usual filming place. I figured why not film this in my office in the Department of Physics at Oxford so you could kind of all see what it was like. This is where I work every day and I've got an upcoming video soon that's sort of like a day in the life of me as an astrophysicist as well, so look out for that. So without further ado, let's get into this because the first question is from Quasar John who asks, how do we calculate the age of star clusters? So a star cluster being, you know, a cluster of stars, like an open cluster or a globular cluster of stars in our Milky Way of anything from sort of a few hundred to tens of thousands of stars all clustered together, much denser than say the neighborhood of stars where we find the sun. So. To figure out the age of a star cluster, it's all about finding the most massive star in the cluster. We assume for star clusters that everything formed at the same time out of the same cloud of gas as well. And so we can assume that all the stars are the same age. Now, bigger stars live much shorter lifetimes than smaller stars do. And that's because they essentially have to burn their fuel much more quicker than the smaller stars to counteract the much bigger effect of gravity pulling them in, which, which is sometimes a little bit counterintuitive because people think bigger stars, more fuel, should last longer. But it's because they have to burn it quicker. Because if we can find the most massive, then that star's mass tells us how much fuel it had in the beginning. And then from the star's brightness, we know how quickly it's burning its fuel. So if we assume that most massive star that we can see is just about to become unstable and, and sort of die, the ratio of how much fuel the star had in the beginning to how much it now has gives us a rough estimate for how long that star has been alive for, and therefore a rough age of the star cluster. As well. Okay, so this next one is from Shredstick72, <laughs> who asks, you ever go stargazing in your free time? Free time? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> um, so I live in um, a pretty big city, and so uh, the stars aren't great from where I am, but I do look, you know, if I'm walking home from the pub or walking back home or something, I will glance up at the night sky, probably see the moon, Jupiter, Venus, the really bright things anyway. You know, I can see Orion, that kind of thing, from where I am walking home. It's only when I tend to go on vacation or on holiday that I get to see the sky how you should get to see the sky. You know, when I'm sort of away from light pollution, either at a beach or up a mountain or in the middle of a forest somewhere, that's when I really get to stargaze and appreciate it. And I tend to dabble in a little bit of astrophotography. It's mainly iPhone astrophotography, to be quite honest, but it is fun when you get to do it. So the next question is from Nate331979, who asks, how did we discover the speed of light? Now, I am planning on doing a video on this exact question, one of my history of like decade by decade or century by century videos in this case, and I'm really excited for that. So I don't kind of want to give the game away too much. All I will say is the first person to measure it was a Danish astronomer called Ole Roma, and he used Jupiter's moons to measure the speed of light. And I'm just going to leave it there to be all mysterious. <laughs> keep you on tenterhooks for the upcoming video. And then ZJ Lerman asks, if there's a primordial black hole in the solar system, what would happen if any material went near it? So for those of you who saw my Night Sky News video from last month, I was talking about this result, or this paper anyway, that said, how about planet nine, this sort of hypothetical extra planet in the solar system that could be disturbing all the planet's orbits and explain lots of different things, was a five centimeter black hole from the beginning of the universe, which I got very excited about that idea. I was like, oh my God, the solar system has a pet black hole. The thing is obviously a five centimeter black hole is very, very small. Yes, it will have a very strong gravitational pull, but only on things that are in the immediate vicinity 
nearby to that black hole. So whilst yes, it will accrete some material as it orbits around the sun, it's not like it's some giant big vacuum cleaner just hoovering everything up as it goes. So there was lots of questions about black holes, which I was very pleased to see because you know that I love black holes. So one of the first black holes were, one of the first black holes, <laughs> One of the first questions about black holes was from Tham San Kuen Daba. I don't know how to say that. I attempted it. Which was black holes, where does the matter go? And then similarly also Alice Tripp asked, what is a black hole? Matter in a black hole doesn't go anywhere. I think the term hole is a little bit misleading. In fact, we should call them black mountains. Because essentially what a black hole is, is just so much matter in one space that it's so dense that the escape velocity from that object is so high that light can't escape. And that obviously creates some weird physics, but it doesn't mean that matter just sort of disappears when it falls beyond the event horizon where light can no longer escape from. Yeah, we don't know what the form the matter takes in the black hole. So in a neutron star, which is kind of like the Pikachu to a black hole's Raichu, in a neutron star, you've just got neutrons arrayed in a crystal as tightly packed as they can go. Essentially, the atomic forces between those particles are repelling them away and repelling the force of gravity, squashing it down. It's just eventually you add too much mass and you do overcome that atomic force. When you do that, though, is, is the point at which you reach a black hole. So we don't really know what form the matter takes, but we know it's still there and it affects the space around it and it has a gravitational effect as well. And that's the thing, without light, without electromagnetic radiation to give us some form of signal from the matter that's actually you know, is that black hole, we have no way of ever knowing what it might be like. Then two more questions on black holes, this time about Hawking radiation in particular. So Jason Bryant asked, wouldn't a black hole emitting Hawking radiation be a white hole slowed by time dilation? And the Jake Roberts asked, why don't black holes turn back into stars after the effects of Hawking radiation? Hawking radiation is a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. I admit that I also struggle to really understand what it is. I deal best with things that I can visualize. So Hawking radiation is a completely theoretical radiation. It means we've never actually observed it. It's only ever been theorized because of our knowledge of physics by Stephen Hawking. This radiation is thought to originate from the event horizon of the black hole, which through quantum physics allows the mass of the black hole to actually reduce in some way. And therefore over time, essentially, evaporate. And it's the gravitational potential energy in the space-time around the black hole that's thought to trigger the creation of what we call virtual particles. And yeah, this is where it starts to be quite difficult to wrap your head around. Essentially, you produce like a particle-antiparticle pair, one of which falls back into the black hole and one of which manages to escape. And because the gravitational energy of the black hole went into creating these virtual particles, it means that the fact that one of them escaped meant that the mass of the black hole has been reduced. So note that even though it lowers the mass, the density doesn't change. So the black hole can get smaller and smaller, but still stay as a black hole, which is why with this Hawking radiation, they don't necessarily become stars by radiating away this mass. Now, Hawking radiation is not something we've ever been able to detect, even though the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope has been searching for the very minute flashes that we should see when these particles are created for couple of decades now and we haven't observed anything. So it could be that it's just too faint for us to see. It could be that it only happens in certain situations or certain sizes of black holes. Perhaps it's only true of primordial black holes that are very, very small as opposed to like super massive black holes, something like that. So the jury is still out on that one. Theoretically, mathematically, it makes complete sense, apparently, <laughs> but observationally, we've never seen it. Now, it's definitely true that any radiation coming from near the event horizon should undergo gravitational redshift, which is where the literally the gravity of the object that the light is moving away from stretches the wavelength of the light to longer wavelengths or redder colors. 
as for it being a white hole, a white hole is something very different. It's again, a very theoretical object. It's supposed to be the exact opposite of a black hole. So instead of something that traps mass and energy there, it's something that's literally just spewing out mass and energy. It's sort of the theorized other side of like a wormhole. If a black hole is something that sort of rips through space time and connects two different parts of the universe, which I don't know if it's a black mountain, I don't really see how that can happen and can wrap my head around it, but perhaps much more intelligent theoretical physicists than me could try and explain it. But for a white hole that wouldn't be Hawking radiation, it's a completely different thing to the energy and mass that a white hole would be spewing out. Remember, Hawking radiation is this quantum process that's governed by the weird and wonderful. All right, next question was from Godzilla0815. They asked, is it true that discovering ozone in an exoplanet's atmosphere would mean that there's life? We think so, yes. So ozone is O3. So three molecules of oxygen, although unlike O2, which is sort of the molecular oxygen that we breathe. And it's created when UV light hits into a molecule of oxygen and dissociates it. So it makes the atoms split apart so they're just... O and not O2. And then eventually three of those separate O molecules can come together and form O3. The thing is to be able to detect O3, there has to be quite a lot of it there. So we detect it through its absorption of a very specific wavelength of light on the light's way through the atmosphere. And then to us here on earth where we then split it into its spectrum and be able to see that dip where the ozone was. To see that though, you have to have a lot of it. And If you have a lot of ozone, it means you have a lot of oxygen in your atmosphere. So even though the ozone is not made necessarily from a, like a human or a life process, the oxygen is, for example, on earth, you know, the biggest source of oxygen is plants photosynthesizing. So if we detect ozone in an atmosphere, it's very, very likely the atmosphere has a lot of oxygen as well, and therefore would be supporting life, or at least life as we know it. Then Mr. Draco, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering all of your Instagram handles, can a brown dwarf or a gas giant ignite if it gets more mass? Theoretically, yes. It's a process called stellification, which is possibly my second favourite word in astrophysics. Yeah, spaghettification definitely takes the top spot. Spaghettification then stellification. So gas giants and brown dwarf stars are mostly made out of hydrogen and helium, just like stars are. So Jupiter, for example, is mostly hydrogen. They're just not dense enough to have a hot enough core to be able to ignite nuclear fusion. Now, theoretically, if you keep adding more and more mass to a brown dwarf, or a gas giant, and you compress it under gravity, then you might hit the right conditions in order to ignite nuclear fusion. But those conditions are incredibly, incredibly dense. And we tend to only find those in the big stellar nurseries where there's just so much gas compressing under gravity. It's not likely that a brown dwarf just hanging around space or even a gas giant just hanging around space would ever encounter those kind of densities. However, There was a study that came out in 1979, which I'll link in the description below. That's true of all papers I mentioned in any of my videos, by the way, they're always in the description below, that showed that an asteroid collision with a gas giant could actually trigger the conditions you needed for nuclear fusion in a tiny region inside the gas giant's atmosphere, which is a really, really cool result. You will be relieved to know, however, that an asteroid striking the Earth's atmosphere could never actually reach those conditions to spark nuclear fusion. So that's nothing to worry about. Not that you were probably worried about it before. (laughs) All right, then F Mertz asked, is it possible that the sun's twin could go undetected this long if it ever had a twin? Now, for those of you who are like, what are you talking about? There is a hypothetical star called Nemesis. It's a brown dwarf star that's been theorized to be in a binary system with the sun, i.e. the two of them are sort of orbiting around a common center of mass. Now, this was first proposed in the 80s because geologists actually found this pattern in the fossil record of mass extinctions every 26 million years or so. And they theorized that it could be because of this binary system. And if the orbit was about 26 million years, then every so often that interaction might trigger 
uh, an influx of asteroids towards the sun and which might cause a mass extinction on Earth. Now, that brown dwarf star has never been found. We have found a bucket load of others up in the thousands towards the tens of thousands in lots of different infrared surveys that have been specifically searching for these brown dwarf stars, but never the apparent closest brown dwarf star to the sun of this nemesis, which is supposed to be about one and a half light years away from us. There was a 2017 paper that argued that maybe the sun did originally form in this binary system, but that it would have separated from it about four billion years ago anyway, and so would never have been responsible for the mass extinctions that the geologists were seeing. So it's an interesting idea, but the fact that it's never been found, despite the fact that we found so many other much fainter further away brown dwarfs, suggests to me that it's probably not there. And there's some other explanation that we're not thinking of. Um, then Astro Newton asked, what's your favourite Star Trek series? Um, I don't know whether I want to say this, but I've never seen Star Trek and I'm just waiting for the hate now in the comments. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, it was before my time. What can I say? It's just so long now. I've not got the time to sit down and watch it all. Um, a couple of my friends a couple of years ago did a, a podcast series called Star, Star Wars. Oh God, that's another faux pas. Star Trek, the rewatch. Um, and they kept jokingly saying that they would get me on for one of the episodes as someone who's never seen it. Although I have seen the films and I did enjoy Chris Pine in those films, I guess. But that's probably worse than never having seen anything at all, isn't it? Just watching the films. And then KV Mom. I always think I sound weird saying mom because we say mum over here, but KV Mom and RKSNJ67 both asked, what made you go into astrophysics or what got you interested in astrophysics? Um, so who made you? Me. I made me because I absolutely love um, astronomy. I was one of those kids that had every space book they could get their hands on. I was asking for a telescope rather than a bike for Christmas. And I just devoured those books. And as I got into high school and realized, oh, actually we're now starting to learn about this in school. And actually this is part of physics and I can study this for university and go on to do a career in this. I mean, I was over the moon, like literally, <laughs> um, that you could actually make a career out of something that you love so much. It was just an absolute no brainer when they were saying, what subjects do you want to continue studying? I was like, my favorite ones, the physics and the maths and the astronomy. Those are the ones I want to do. And it was then kind of a no brainer eventually when I started sort of thinking what I actually want to do with my life. I want to do what I love. KB Mom also asked what other areas of science interest you? Uh, I love marine biology. I think it's awesome. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid, mainly because I was obsessed with dolphins because which nine year old isn't obsessed with dolphins. Um, they're just such amazing creatures and I, as part of my sort of like gap year, mini gap year thing that I took, I did marine conservation in the Bahamas like for six weeks learning to dive and doing all like coral reef surveys. I think the conservation of ocean habitats is specifically coral reefs given the current climate emergency that we're going through is of utmost importance and I wish I could help in any way that I can. I really do try. I would love to collaborate with a marine biologist as well someday, either like academically or on YouTube. That would be awesome. I don't know what we'd talk about, but we'd find some connection somewhere. <laughs> uh, Gary Satterfield 79 asked, if a gas expands to fill a volume, that's what we learn in school, right? Uh, how does it become dense enough to form a star? Gravity, essentially. Gravity is an incredibly useful force, even though it's one of the weakest. Uh, without it, we wouldn't have any structure in the universe. Essentially, gas particles start to clump together under gravity in one of these huge, big clouds that seed star formation. And because things start to clump together, they then became the heaviest thing in that gas cloud, which then attracts more and more particles. And eventually it becomes so, so dense that you can spark nuclear fusion. Then Max D. McCormick asks, what's your opinion on the Mauna Kea 30 meter telescope controversy? So for those who haven't heard about this, Mauna Kea is a mountain, an extinct volcano on the big island in Hawaii. It is 4,000 meters tall and it is one of the best places to do astronomy in the world because it is so isolated in the middle of the Pacific away from light pollution. It's incredibly high, so you're looking through a lot less atmosphere that will disturb your observations. And it's also very dry up there as well, being above sort of the cloud layer. I think it's awful the way 
the local people have been treated in this whole situation. It's it's like everything went over their heads, which I think is just not right. If you're going to build on someone's sacred mountain, talk to them. And unfortunately that's got so mishandled, we're now at the point where the locals feel like they have to protest against what's happening and stop construction. And of course, as an astronomer, I want to see this telescope built, but not at the detriment of all of these local people. To give you a little bit of the politics behind it, there's two of these 30 meter telescopes being built. One in the Northern Hemisphere, which is the one in Hawaii, and one in the Southern Hemisphere, which is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And that is gonna be the Europeans telescope, the European Southern Observatory, ESO. And so anyone from Europe will be able to use that telescope. Now the Northern Hemisphere one is supposed to be an American-Japanese collaboration. And so the options for building the 30 meter telescope in the Northern Hemisphere were Mauna Kea or La Palma, which is the Canary Islands just off the coast of Africa. Now, of course, that location would have been closer to Europe, much further away for anyone in Japan flying out. And of course, not on US soil either, so much further away for them to fly out. And so that location wasn't chosen. Mauna Kea was chosen, again, over the local people's heads. So there's so much politics and horrendous stuff in here. So I have no solution for this problem, unfortunately, but I hope it gets resolved. Now, not the CEO asked, what's your favorite astrophysical phenomenon? And those of you who know me know exactly what I'm about to say, but it's an active galactic nucleus, what we call it AGN. It's what I study as part of my research. They are active, growing, supermassive black holes. So black holes about a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, which are also accreting matter. So growing by pulling in matter from their surroundings, anywhere from sort of like one sun's worth of stuff per year, to like a hundred sun's worth of stuff per year. And they're so, so cool. They're the most energetic things in the universe and they are amazing. I love them. Okay, then Elm Fognifico uh, asked, could the age of the universe be way more or less than we think or is there no debate on it? There is a huge debate raging. Local measurements estimate it at about 14 or so billion years, and then measurements of the echo of the Big Bang measure it at around 13 and a half billion years or something, and we're getting more and more accurate in those measurements, and that means that the error bars in those measurements no longer overlap anymore. And that is a huge issue. In next week's Night Sky News, I'm actually gonna cover a paper that came out this month that was entitled Crisis in Cosmology, because they reanalyzed the data from the echo from the Big Bang, and that discrepancy has gotten even worse, and we don't know why. And it's a huge issue, because it means that our best model of the universe might have something wrong with it, or it means that the data that we've been basing all our observations on for the past decade might have something wrong with it. And then the last question comes from Dustin T.P. Scott, who says, are there any free courses that someone interested in astrophysics could take? Yes, there are. Now they're not gonna be, you know, fully examined university undergraduate courses, those you do have to pay for, and there are some very good ones out there. In the UK, the Open University does brilliantly with that, and I'll link that down below. In terms of like, watching undergraduate lectures, a lot of universities will put those online as sort of like a video podcast kind of situation. And I know that Oxford does do that because that's where I'm based, so it's what I know. So again, I'll link that below. But if you want to actually do more of an interactive kind of a course, the best thing to search for would be MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S, Modular Online Something Courses. Editing Becky will figure that one out because I can't remember what it is. But if you search for those, perhaps in your home country and astronomy, you should find something very, very cool that can hopefully maybe give you a bit more background in the maths, if that's what you wanna do, uh, that I don't tend to cover on this channel. And I lied, that wasn't the last question. The last question was, what do you think will be the biggest discovery in the next 30 years? It's very difficult to say because you don't know where technology or physics is going to go, but I guess the biggest discovery that I think will come our way is this detection of like biosignatures 
in exoplanet atmospheres like ozone. And I think that will come with the launch of JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, that's essentially going to be sort of like Hubble telescopes replacement in the next two-ish years, maybe? Fingers crossed, everything crossed, everybody. I think we're pretty much there and JWST will be the key. It'll just be finding which planet actually has those biosignatures and atmospheres, because we know so many now as well, and there's obviously so many more out there. I think it's going to be a really exciting time as people search for that life signature needle in a haystack of planets. Before I go, just thank you all so, so much for subscribing, for watching my videos, for following on Twitter and Instagram, for buying my book, for reading my book, for reviewing my book, all of the above. I'm so overwhelmed by the support and I can't stress enough how much I like to scroll down to the comments and see all of your science questions in there. There's no greater feeling than when you make a video and someone watches it, thinks about it, and then asks a follow-up question because they've sort of listened and understood. It's so, so gratifying. And so the more questions you have for me, the better. Maybe if in the future I hit 100,000 subscribers, we can do this like as a live Q&A session or something. Let me know if you'd be interested in seeing those down in the comments. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. You know that in the future, videos to come will be Spaces Weird, Unsolved Mysteries, Night Sky News, the story of videos as well. Obviously more nailing science for those who are scientific nail art lovers just like me. And I hope that you all enjoy those videos on my channel and I'm gonna go before I get all emotional now. Bye bye. Sh they showed that an ass. Who's this sneeze? <laughs> this is the problem with like glass walls. That showed that an asteroid collision with a ja a jazz giant? Oh.